A disaster was as close as the press of a red button. Four Russian submarines patrolled the Florida coast. U.S. warships put, put down depth charges. Those are like anti-submarine uh, weapons of war. Uh, you drop it close to a submarine and it goes off and it, it you know, does, uh, puts the sub in hydraulic uh, distress. The uh, four submarines all had uh, nuclear warheads, uh, all en enough to deliver a Hiroshima-level calamity. Uh, had it not been for the clear-thinking calm of one officer, World War III could have begun in 1962. Uh, his name was Vasily Arkhipov, 36-year-old chief of staff of that cled clandestine fleet of four subs. Uh, the Q members were uh, commissioned to travel 5,000 miles to set up a spearhead uh, by, in, by Havana, Cuba. Uh, to go faster, they traveled on top of the water. They did fine until they hit Hurricane Daisy. The 50-foot waves caused all the seamen to be uh, nauseated. Then they hit the warm waters. Uh, Russian subs are uh, designed for polar waters not for the uh, tropical Atlantic. Uh, temperatures in the subs uh, exceeded 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So by the time they arrived in Havana, the, the, the crew was uh, exhausted, nauseated, and tense. Things got worse when they got a cryptic command to travel north uh, to patrol the Florida coast. As soon as they hit Florida, they, their radar told them that they, uh, about 12 ships were by them. They were being tracked by us, by the Americans. Uh, then we sent down depth charges, and they assumed they were being attacked. Well, the commander lost his cool. He, he, brought, he, he summoned all his officers to the command post. He says, that's it. We're going to attack. We're going to destroy them all. We'll all die, but at least our Navy won't be disgraced. We would have had World War III. But that's when Arkhipov asked for a word with his superior. And they stepped to the side and he said, you sure you want to do this? Don't you think we should talk to the Americans before we react? And so his superior calmed down and listened to him and gave the order for the subs to surface. The American forces circled them. I don't know what happened at that point, but they talked and they let the submarines go back to Russia. We never heard about this for 40 more years. Never became public knowledge until 2002. It's now part of the National Archive. Arkhipov deserved to have a Medal of Honor but he lived on in anonymity. But the director of the National Archive says, the lesson from this event is that a guy named Vasily Arkhipov saved the world. Now, what's the importance of this story? You'll probably not be in a uh, Russian sub for three weeks, but you may carry a heavy class load in a semester in school you may have, be responsible for a, a, a project at work that has you on total overload. You may have to sit night after night at the side of a sick child or aging parent. Whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, you may have to take steps to save a marriage, keep a business afloat, keep an organization from falling apart. You'll be tempted to press the button and release. Not nuclear warheads, but angry outbursts, rash accusations, fiery retaliation. When something happens, you may be tempted to lash out on social media. How many of you have uh, been the subject of somebody else's fiery reaction? They're livid with you, either on social media or in person. Just raise your hand. And most of you have your hands up. How many disasters have been averted 
because one person refused to buckle under the strain. It's this composure that the Apostle Paul summons when he writes, let your gentleness be evident to all. When you show gentleness, family members take notice. Friends sense a difference. Your coworkers benefit. Your teammates can draw a breath and calm down. Gentle people understand the dangers of quick trigger anger. Solomon writes, why don't you read this with me? Whoever is patient has great understanding, but one who is quick-tempered displays folly. And then he also says, read this with me, fools give full vent to their rage, but the wise bring calm in the end. Gentleness. Where do we quarry this gem? How can you and I keep our hands away from the quick trigger anger? How can we keep our heads when everyone around us is losing theirs? How can we avoid quick trigger anger? I'm an impatient man. I'm a type A personality and things happen to me every day that slow me down and I'm not proud of it, but I realize I'm just a step away many times from anger. So how do we avoid quick trigger anger? God has preserved a story that shows us three ways to avoid quick trigger anger. Parents, teach these principles to your children so they can learn how to control their anger while they're young. Turn with me to 1 Samuel 25 in your Bible. If you want to use our Bibles, it's on page 293. One, remember that you can't live today on yesterday's obedience. Like many of us, David learned the hard way. You can't live today on yesterday's obedience. Against the nine foot nine inch giant, Goliath, David trusted God to protect him as he went into battle. When Saul came into the cave to relieve himself and his soldiers urged him to kill David, or kill Saul, he restrained himself and refused to take vengeance into his own hand, but left it to God. But today, something ticks off David to quick trigger anger. Now let's, let's review. David is anointed, was anointed uh, to be the next king of Israel. He goes into battle in the power of the spirit and defeats Goliath and all the Philistines. Saul hires him to be a commander in his army and he's very successful against the Philistines. Saul's daughter, Michal, falls in love with David. So Saul gives him his daughter in marriage. Saul's son, Jonathan, grows to love David. He becomes David's best friend. All of this makes Saul extremely jealous. He knows that David's anointed to be the next king and so he tries to kill him. This drives David to flee out into the Dead Sea Desert for 10 years. He's on the run as a fugitive. It's a good place for him to hide because it's one of the most uninhabitable places on this planet. 1 Samuel 25. Now Samuel died. Samuel's the prophet who anointed David. And all Israel assembled and mourned for him. And they buried him at his home in Ramah. All Israel gathered except David. David dared not go to the memorial service. So David moved down into the desert of Paran. A certain man in Maon, which is in Paran, who had property there at Carmel, was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats and three thousand sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. He's a wealthy man. He has a big operation. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband was surly and mean in his dealings. He was a Calebite. Uh, Nabal is not the most popular man on the block. He's stubborn and dishonest. His Hebrew name means that he's a fool. He owns goats and sheep, and he's proud of it. He keeps his liquor cabinet full, his date life hot. He motors around in a stretch limo. His NBA seats are front row. His jet is Lear, and he's prone to hop over to Vegas from time to time for Texas Hold'em. 
Half a dozen linebacker-sized security guards guard him, and he needs it because he's churlish and ill-behaved. While David was in the wilderness, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. So he sent ten young men and said to them, Go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. Say to him, Long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours. Now I hear that it is sheep shearing time. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them. And the whole time they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. Ask your own servants and they will tell you. Therefore, be favorable toward my men, since we come at a festive time. Please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for them. Uh, David plays a Robin Hood role in the desert. Uh, he and 600 soldiers protected uh, Nabal's uh, shepherds and their herds. Uh, Israel had no homeland security. They didn't have highway patrol. So David and his men fulfilled that role. It was common custom in those days, much like our practice of tipping waiters and waitresses, that if someone's guarding your shepherds and flocks, when it's sheep shearing time, you share. And uh, David's petition is reasonable. It's diplomatic. He doesn't specify any amount he wants Nabal to, to give. Nabal answered David's servants, Who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to men coming from who knows where? David and his men have been working for Nabal, but when it's sheep shearing time, he doesn't pay up. Stingy Nabal refuses their gracious request, leaving David both hungry and insulted. Nabal pretends he's never heard of David. I mean, obviously he's heard of David. Everybody in Israel knows that David defeated Goliath and delivered them from the Philistines. Everybody knows that David is a, uh, a, a commander in the army and he's won battle after battle against the Philistines. Nabal should have been grateful to David for delivering the nation from the Philistines. Everything Nabal owns is riding on a stone in David's sling some years before. The Philistines would have taken over Israel had Goliath triumphed over David. Yet Nabal acts as if he owes David nothing. Put yourself in David's shoes. You've been anointed by God. You're to be the next king. You've been protecting his sheep and his goats. You've risked your life to protect Nabal's flocks. And now you've been grossly insulted. How would you respond? Nabal's belligerent response boils David's blood. David had controlled himself against Goliath and Saul. But for some reason, this is the straw that breaks the camel's back. This mistreatment pushed him over the edge and something within him snapped. David's men turned around and went back. When they arrived, they reported every word. David said to his men, each of you, strap on your sword. So they did, and David strapped his on as well. About 400 men went up with David, while 200 stayed with the supplies. David is angry. 400 men mount up and take off. Eyes glare, nostrils flare, lips snarl, tes testosterone flows. David and his troops thunder down on Nabal. David had just said, it's been useless. All my watching over this fellow's property in the wilderness so that nothing of his was missing. He has paid me back evil for good. May God deal with David, be it ever so severely, if by morning I leave alive one male of all who belong to him. What happened to the cool, calm David who refused to murder Saul? David, what's going on with you? One of the most wonderful things we learned about you last week is your patience and not taking vengeance into your own hands, but leaving vengeance to God. But now look at you, your restraint has fallen to pieces. A few insulting words from the fool, Nabal, 
and you see red. David, what's going wrong with you? The problem with David is the same problem we all face. We can't live today on yesterday's obedience. Temptations assault us every day. They come hardest after our greatest victories. You say, I just pulled off the biggest business deal of my life. I just completed the hardest semester in school I've ever had. I just won the biggest athletic competition in my history. I just got out of debt and it feels so good. My friend just gave her life to Christ. I've never been any part of anything so exciting before. I feel so close to Christ. Be careful. This is when the temptation will come. You are never more vulnerable when you feel like you're invincible. When you're at the top of the world and you think you've got everything under control, that's the time to be careful. A couple psychologists did a study on university students some years back. They gathered the students and they sent them off one at a time. They said, we want you to walk across campus, five-minute walk, and give a talk. You need to hurry. They're waiting for you. What they didn't tell them is they were putting in the path someone laying there in medical need. How many do you think stopped on the path? Just turn to somebody next to you and what percent do you think stopped? All right, how many picked a high percentage? Raise your hand. A couple of you. How many picked a low percentage? I guess that'd be the rest of you, huh? 10% stopped. When we're in a hurry, we tend not to notice people around us. When we think we're important and we've got places to be, we don't even see the needs around us. But that's not the end of the story. These weren't just any students. These were seminarians. People like Chris Quinn and Micah Page. They're both in their last year of seminary. People like me went to seminary years ago. I graduated in the same class as Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> and they were told to give a talk on the Good Samaritan. Good Samaritan is the one who stopped on the path to help somebody in need. When we think we're doing great as a Christ follower, watch out. You can't live today on yesterday's obedience. Every day you must offer a new prayer to God and say, God, help me to handle the temptations today and depend on your Holy Spirit minute by minute. Two, become a gentle influence that calms storms. David and his men have strapped on their swords. Then all of a sudden, beauty appears. A daisy appears in the desert. A whiff of women's perfume floats through the men's locker room. Abigail, the wife of Nabal, stands in their path. Abigail's informed of what just happened. And she comes up with a plan that will protect her husband, sate David's hunger, and abate his anger. She flies into action. Abigail acted quickly. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five seahs of roasted grain, a hundred cakes of raisin, and two hundred cakes of pressed figs, and loaded them on donkeys. Then she told her servants, go on ahead, I'll follow you. <coughs> but she did not tell her husband, Nabal. As she came riding her donkey into a mountain ravine, there were David and his men descending toward her, and she met them. She's good looking with good cooking. <laughs> Combination that'll stop any army. Picture a neck snapping blonde showing up at a boot camp with a truck full of burgers and ice cream. When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed down before David with her face to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, pardon your servant, my Lord. Let me speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. Please pay no attention, my Lord, to that wicked man, Nabal. He is just like his name. His name means fool. And folly goes with him. But as for me, your servant, I did not see the man my Lord sent. 
Please forgive your servant's presumption. She takes all responsibility for the whole fiasco and begs for his forgiveness. Then she tells him, David, you don't want any unnecessary bloodshed on your name. You're going to be the next king of Israel. You don't want that on your record. So don't do this. And now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord your God lives and as you live, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, may your enemies and all who are intent on harming my Lord be like Nabal. The Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord because you fight the Lord's battles and no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live. When the Lord has fulfilled for my Lord every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him ruler over Israel, my Lord will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or having avenged himself. Abigail makes all the difference. Her brains... Her beauty, her gentleness, her calm in the midst of impending danger. Ernest Gordon groans in the death house of Chiang Kai, Burma. He listens to the moans of the dying and the smells, the stench of the dead. Pitiless jungle heat beats down on him, baking his skin and parching his throat. Had he the strength, he could put his whole hand around his bony thigh. But he doesn't have the energy or the interest. Diphtheria has drained his body. How harsh the war has been on him. He entered World War II from Scotland in his early 20s, and then came the Japanese capture. You know, terrible life in the jungle, daily beatings, and slow starvation. The Allied forces begin acting like barbarians. They're stealing from each other their rations, robbing them of their belongings, fighting over scraps of food. Those, the, the, those that are serving hold back some of their rations so they have extra for themselves. The law of the jungle has become the law of the camp. Gordon is happy to bid it adieu. Death by disease trumps living in Chiang Kai. And then something wonderful happens. Two new prisoners show up. They're sick and frail too, but they heed a higher calling. They share their rations. They share their belongings. And it begins to rub off on others. It becomes contagious. And Gordon contracts the case. He begins to share his food. He gives away all his belongings. Things begin to change in the camp. The whole camp softens and brightens. They begin to have Bible studies and worship services. Twenty years later, when Gordon had decided to become a pastor became a chaplain at Princeton University. He described the transformation. Death was still with us, no doubt about that, but we were slowly being freed from its destructive grip. Selfishness, hatred, and pride were all anti-life. Love, self-sacrifice, and faith, on the other hand, were the essence of life, gifts of God. Death no longer had the last word at Chiang Kai. Selfishness, pride, fighting, you don't have to go to a prisoner of war camp to find that. Any dormitory will work. Or any corporation boardroom. Or many marriage bedrooms. Or the halls of power in Washington, D.C. Every person for himself. The survival of the fittest. The survival of the fittest sound like your life? There's something more that happened at Chiang Kai. After work one day, a Japanese, the Japanese, a Japanese guard said, a shovel is missing. Step forward, whoever stole it. And he waited, and nobody moved. And he cocked his rifle, ready to shoot one prisoner at a time until somebody fessed up. Suddenly, a Scottish soldier stepped forward. He said, I did it. 
And the guard beat him to death. When he was exhausted, the men picked up the dead soldier and they went back to camp. Once back in camp, they recounted the shovels. The guard had been wrong. No shovels were taken. Who does that? What kind of person takes the blame for something they didn't do? When you figure out the adjective, attach it to Jesus. He knew no sin, but he took your sins and mine on his shoulders and died for us. One person can change the whole atmosphere in a situation. Jesus is changing the world one person at a time. Do you find your navel hard to stomach? Then do what Abigail did. Become the gentle influence that changes your marriage, that transforms your home. It can revolutionize the way everybody treats each other at your place of work or on your team. Like Abigail, be the beauty in the midst of the beasts. Be the change agent in your home, family, work, or school. Three, be humble and willing to admit when you're wrong. Uh, Abigail's words struck deeply into David. David said to Abigail, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to meet me. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. Otherwise, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, who has kept me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, not one male belonging to Nabal would have been left alive by daybreak. Then David accepted from her hand what she had brought him and said, Go home in peace. I have heard your words and granted your request. David's raging anger is abated by Abigail's wisdom. His eyes focused on the Lord once again, which has been the theme of this series. He humbles himself. He lets go of his anger. He recognizes he's about to make a huge mistake. Even though David sinned in his anger toward um, Nabal, he remained teachable and willing to change. This is another reason David is called a man after God's own heart. David did a lot of things wrong, but he humbles himself and quickly confesses it. It's not perfection that gives us hearts or causes us to become people after God's own heart. It's humility to be quick to admit it when we're wrong. When Abigail went to Nabal, he was in the house holding a banquet like that of a king. He was in high spirits and very drunk. So she told him nothing at all until daybreak. Then in the morning when Nabal was sober, his wife told him all these things. And his heart failed him and he became like a stone. About ten days later, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. I don't know exactly what that meant. I never looked it up. But I, I take it to mean he had a stroke. And then ten days later, he died. And then the story has a very interesting ending. Then David sent word to Abigail asking her to become his wife. So what do we learn from this account? Avoid quick trigger anger. Remember, you can't live today on yesterday's obedience. You have to depend on the Holy Spirit every day, minute by minute. Become the gentle influence that calms storms and be humble and willing to admit when you're wrong. Would you pray with me? Lord God, thank you for preserving this story in the Bible. We want to be like Abigail, wise, calm in the storm. It's so easy to get angry quickly. We want to be humble like David and admit when we're about to do something stupid with anger and confess it. And we want to learn that we can't live today on yesterday's obedience. 
It's every day. We have to recommit ourselves to Christ, resubmit. I want to give you a chance to do that right now. Let's all keep our heads bowed and I want you to pray to God. If, if, if you are convicted today, maybe you've got issues with anger like I do. I want to tell God you want to, you want to deal with this. Uh, you tell him that right now. If you've never committed your life to Christ, I don't see any better time. Say you believe Jesus is God's son. You want him to forgive you and come into your life. You pray. Lord, we, would, we don't want to give in to doing foolish things when we're angry, wrecking homes or businesses or schools, lashing out on social media. So help us, Lord, to learn from this story. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.